Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to this webinar organized by our regional hub in Argentina called My Climate Risk. I am Leandro Diaz. I'm a climate researcher at the National Council for Technical and Scientific uh, Research Center in Argentina. With me again as well is Maria Florencia Fosa Riglas. She's an anthropologist and is a researcher at the Interdisciplinary College for High Social Studies at the National University of San Martín. And we're going to be moderating this meeting. For those who are not familiar with My Climate Risk, this is one of our flagship activities within the World Programme for Climate Research. Its aim is to develop and integrate climate sciences with a bottom-up approach, bearing in mind regional climate risk, looking at the context and scale of uh, decisions and which may allow to introduce in this context the climate information that is relevant. My Climate Risk is organized as a network of hubs. Each works in its own specific context in various locations around the world, but we share knowledge and resources to make progress towards a joint aim. At the moment, we have 14 hubs worldwide. And as you can see, there is just one hub in Latin America. This may change, however, if more uh, Latin American communities join the activity. In the case of the Argentina hub, we have a team of 20 um, students, professors, researchers from different disciplines, and we work together to bring relevant knowledge to society. For a year and a half now, we have been meeting regularly to develop a common understanding as an interdisciplinary group on what we understand as the main concepts uh, surrounding the activity My Climate Risk. I am Florencia Fossa Riglos. As Leandro just said, I'd also like to join him in welcoming you to this new webinar. And the topic we're going to be addressing today is co-production of hydroclimatic knowledge. There are so many ways to create and co-produce knowledge, public science, participatory science, collaboratory science, co-production of knowledge, ethnoscience, and many others, but today, we're going to focus on two of these. Initially, we'll be hearing about an experience of co-production of knowledge. And in our second presentation, we'll be looking at particip participative science, or we're going to be looking at two different approaches to respond to the challenge of how to build hydroclimatic knowledge, which is relevant to society given the climate emergency. So if you agree, we're going to listen to presentation number one, uh, Camila Prudente. She has a degree in atmospheric sciences from the, the University of Buenos Aires. She is currently doing her PhD in atmospheric and ocean sciences at Buenos Aires University and works at the Research Center for Sea and Atmosphere and the French Argentinian uh, Institute on Climate and Impacts, directed by Dr. Federico Robledo, a climatologist, and Dr. Miriam Hernandez, an anthropologist. Her PhD focuses on the Paraguay River and the variability, hydroclimatic variability associated there and impacts in certain regions of Argentina. To get a better understanding of local dynamics of the uh, Cuenca, the La Plata River Basin, there is a lot of co-production of science and knowledge to establish community monitoring systems uh, with local people, local uh, researchers from the northeastern part of Argentina and the province of Buenos Aires. So before we listen to Camila and her presentation, please, if you have any questions, please write them down in the uh, Q&A section and uh, you simply use the chat for technical issues. Well, thank you very much. And Camila, you have the floor. Hello, everyone. 
I'll share my screen now. Let me know if you can see it properly. Yes, we can see it properly. Thank you. Well, that's great. Thank you. So I will begin. I am Camila Prudente. I, and I am going to be talking about a community network for hydrological monitoring through co-production of knowledge. This is part of my PhD, which is being led by Federico Robledo Valeria Hernández, as mentioned in the introduction. So what is the main reason for my PhD work? Well, in South America, providing climate services at regional and local level is hindered by a number of challenges. For example, limited understanding of climate processes, the scarcity of in situ observations of meteorological variables, also difficulties in social appropriation of scientific knowledge, and the need to build effective communication channels between academia and local knowledge and local people. Now, on the basis of that, those premises, we have the CLIMAX project, Climate Services Through Knowledge Co-Production. The aim, primary goal, is to co-produce knowledge in relation to climate to improve the ability of social communities to respond to climate events, especially those affecting the farming industry and the energy system or se sector. This drawing uh, illustrates the co-production of climate services. Here, we see many institutions and agencies involved. All of these related to the farming sector, research, many others. You can actually check our project to get more detail on uh, using this QR code or our website. Now, in addition, to gaining a better understanding of the physical processes uh, which affect climate in Latin America, the OWL project takes two cases of co-production, one in Brazil with the hydroelectric sector and another in Argentina, which has to do with a family estate, a farming estate. I'm going to be focusing on the case in Argentina. It's located in a province northeast of Argentina. It's called province of Chaco, and more specifically, this department here called Bermejo. This is a map of the county or department of Bermejo and the main uh, streams and rivers that you can see there. So this process began with a, an interdisciplinary dialogue and also an intersectorial dialogue with the various actors involved. On the one hand, small and medium-sized producers, farmers, also agents from farming institutions like the National Institute uh, for in Argentina, also hydrological agents like the National Water Agency or the Chaco Water Agency, also teachers and students at schools and colleges, for example, a secondary school in Bermejo, and also anthropologists, a center for anthropological sciences, and also a uh, center for climate activities and climate research. Now, what about the theoretical framework? We've adopted the approach called implied science, which is based upon three premises. Firstly, a non-instrumental dialogue, that is to understand the differences between the respective points of view of the various stakeholders and to agree on an interpretation process that identifies points, common points and discrepancies between judgments. The second premise is called symmetry of knowledge. That is, we apply a symmetrical assessment of the various knowledge systems involved on a given topic. And the third premise, a symmetry of power. 
that is, the identification of social and power relations and structures, we identify relationships and tensions between the stakeholders and knowledge systems involved, including scientists and potential extraterritorial tensions. Let me give you a bit of background on this project in Bermejo. The project began in 2016, starting with a ethnographic in situ research uh, carried out by a group of anthropologists, which allowed to establish uh, trust with local actors and the local community. From here, we were able to develop a number of products in terms of climate uh, products. One of the products that's been developed over the years has been a network to monitor rainfall in Bermejo. It's a community network. They started using weather gauges and rainfall gauges in their homes to measure the amount of daily rainfall. Each person uh, has been trained in order to be able to measure rainfall and the data are registered. They're put on a computer and they're uploaded to a web application, which you can also check using this QR code. This is an application that we have jointly developed and which not only gives us the data measured by the network, but also has a forecasting tool specific to the region of Bermejo. So on the follow-up to this process, there was a lot of more interest in looking at monitoring rivers, not just monitoring rainfall, so that was the start of uh, the Bermejo Hydrological Monitoring Network. And I'm showing it to you here on this map uh, in violet, in purple. You can see all uh, of uh, those gauges that have been set up there in the apartment. We started uh, with the, the first uh, measurement uh, point there under this bridge. Uh, that was back in 2018. And we have been... Uh, using different uh, ways of setting up those uh, measurement points. The whole process uh, has been run under a, a co-production cycle methodology, a specific methodology. And we, it started off with the insulation, the co-design of that for the new hydro rulers. They, the strategic locations were chosen by the local community so that they could quite easily see where the measurement point was. Training followed up. There are a number of people responsible for these points, uh, at least one person. They're the ones that have to do the measurement and take the data. Then there is the reporting and publication or dissemination of the data. This is open data that is shared through the whole community using different tools. And one of those tools is uh, simply a WhatsApp group message. Another mechanism is uh, the local radio station, which also broadcasts the data. The cycle continues, the sequence continues. Uh, there is a systematic compilation of the data with the information on the social context of a measurement, the impact, uh, the measurement and management uh, of the data. And the next step is the generation of new knowledge about the rivers in Bermejo that can be spread throughout the scientific community and the local community. It's also helpful in decision-making. The next step is the extension of the network to bring in new stakeholders. Some of this knowledge in the dialogue process, thanks to this piece of work, is about how the water is flowing, how it is moving around Bermejo. This department is in the, is in, in the Plata uh, watershed, in that basin, it's the second biggest one in Latin America. And it's in this part of the region, you can see the Paraguay River uh, and how it flows into the Paraná 
river and I'm using my mouse pointer to show you that point on the map. On this particular map here, you can see the Paraguay River marked in green and in blue, it's the Paraná River. Uh, this is an alluvia plain with just a gentle slope. That is why the river flow is very similar to what you would expect to see for rivers on a plain. The Paraná River, the Blue River, is flowing this way. Now the way uh, its source is up in the east of Brazil and it's flowing southward towards uh, Argentina and into La Plata River. And uh, the Paraguay River, which flows into the Paraná River, is a, a river which is flowing across a flat piece of land. The terrain is flat. And of course, it depends on the Paraná River's flood pulses with those flash floods. Uh, there is a, also an effect where the water is flowing in the opposite direction sometimes, so it goes upstream. And the local rivers here in Bermejo, in this department, which flow uh, from northwest to southeast, generally speaking, occasionally too, depending on the flood pulses in the case of both of those rivers, Paraguay and Marana, can also prompt this opposite direction flow. So all of this know-how form part of the dialogue between scientists and the local community. In addition, the local community has the knowledge, for instance, about the, the the extreme circumstances that may have led to certain um, heights of the water, the measurement level, they even remember sometimes that it could have been as high as tree level. And the local producers, the local farmers have their own early warning strategies because they have this previous experience and they know how to actually improve their output in that way. And the local community, one of the things that it can do is perhaps delineate and indicate potentially floodable areas and those areas that may be affected by heavy rainfall. And so there will be these, uh, this uh, extra flow in either of those two rivers, Paraguay and Paraná, that will lead to this flash flood. So then uh, there has been an exercise in community mapping in Limitas. Now that is a particular area in the south of this department. I've marked it with a square on this map. Now, what is this exercise? It's an activity which basically means that the local farmers, local producers meet scientists. They use a, a large scale, a large size map to be able to identify houses, uh, bodies of water, areas that are prone to flooding, areas that are not prone to flooding. And the main river course is uh, this river, the Guayacuru, which I'm also pointing to with my mouse pointer. That is actually on the border, the boundaries of the department and also flows into the Paraná. So this activity allows different locations to be marked on the map. And at that uh, event, those farmers talked about how they can actually warn others because of the thresholds for the Paraná River. Addis is a very important river. There are official data for that river. And they explained how they can implement preventive strategies. They can move their livestock away, for instance. They can move them from low-lying areas and take their livestock to areas that are not so prone to flooding because they are higher up when they think there may be uh, this um, flash flood or, this, or the river may be in spate. So, 
shortly after this event, when the Paraná did in fact uh, have uh, an extra flow, there was a drought scenario. The Paraguay and the local Bermejo rivers uh, had very little water in them because the river level had not risen. There was th this flood pulse here uh, in the river Paraná, which was in mid-July. And between the 15th and 17th of July, the Bermejo Hydrological Monitoring Red uh, Network rather, reported uh, that uh, the level reached 24 centimeters there. It, the river grew to 78, it rose to 78 centimeters, and the data was then put into a, a table and it meant that the local river levels could be cross-checked with the thresholds of the major rivers, such as the Paraná, uh, looking at the time series that existed for those data. To, to, to finish off, I'd like to pick out some highlights of this uh, work that is still ongoing. I was explaining that the qualitative information that the local farmers have can be turned into quantitative information through new measurements of local river levels. And that means that the impact of extreme events can be assessed. Another highlight is that the local com community starts to be more independent and is able to also produce uh, and um, disseminate the knowledge about river levels. The network can always promote the development of an early warning system for flooding. And this exercise, this study is also a means of uh, setting up an, an element or an instrument to improve adaptation strategies for climate change. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions for me, I'd be very happy to answer them. Well, thank you very much to Camila for that uh, great presentation. I think I'd like to introduce you now to Julieta, who will be making the second pre presentation. She's a professor of uh, anthropological sciences uh, at the Buenos Aires University. She is currently working with uh, a grant uh, for a PhD from the, uh, the National Board for Scientific and Technical Research. Uh, she's also doing a PhD in social anthropology and uh, she is on part, this is in, in the Rural and Globalization Studies Program at San Martin University. She is um, under the supervision of Dr. Valeria and under them, she's researching social dynamics that are organized with regard to extreme climate events, focusing on that relationship between uh, public policies to manage uh, disaster risk, uh, the practices of civil society and the provision of climate services. I would remind you, please, that you can keep your questions until the Q&A session comes up. Uh, you can ask the questions for the presenters then. Use the chat just for technical issues, if you wouldn't mind. So Julieta, let me give you the floor now for your presentation. Well, thank you very much. Leandro, I'm also going to share my screen with you. If you could just confirm that you're seeing my share screen. You, you can't see it. You're not showing it uh, in presentation mode so far. Now, can you see it? Yes, we can see it now. Thank you, let me start then. Well, good morning or good afternoon to all of you. What I'm going to show you now is, is an introductory presentation. I'm going to explain a dialogue process uh, that we have been running for a number of years now in the province of Buenos Aires in Argentina. We are addressing the problem of uh, local flooding. This is a dialogue which is an open-ended dialogue. It's still ongoing today. And unlike the experience that Camila has been presenting you today, this is not necessarily a co-production project as part of a specific mitigation project, uh, such as uh, climate, the climax, uh, as she was explaining before. This is a process that has run over time 
bringing together different projects, different disciplines and different actors. So this is the, the municipal area in which the dialogue process is being run. It's called Santonio San de Reco. It's located to the north of Buenos Aires province in Argentina. And it, and it uh, is uh, the main town there. According to the 2022 census, uh, the, this area has 26,620 inhabitants, and most of these people live uh, in the main town in this province. The current boundaries were, were established uh, in eight, 1800. Uh, this is a, an area with boundaries uh, with certain flows of water crossing it. San, this area is part of uh, the Areco River, Basin, you can see it here, with the typical characteristics of a of a flat, uh, uh, sinuous uh, river. But fifteen to thirty meters is uh, the average uh, height there, and this uh, can change when it gets close to the mouth of the River Paraná. As I said, this is uh, the southeast northeast uh, direction, and during the course. Uh, it receives uh, the contribution of water from different streams and the main river course it cross, crosses Carmen de Rico and also San Antonio de Rico. So Carmen de Rico is located in the higher point of the basins and there are no houses along the riverbanks, unlike San Antonio de Rico, though, which is uh, at a lower level. And according to the ethnographic fieldwork that was done, it was from 1980 onwards, when the river in San Antonio Reco started to be part of an area where the four neighborhoods were consolidated. And they are the neighborhoods that are more prone to problem of the river overflow and flooding. So historically, the water essentially has played a huge role in the life of the people in the community. So we started to talk with the town hall of Areco in 2015, after that flooding there, the municipality was affected by a flooding due to overflow of the Areco River. So a team looked at all the areas affected in the municipality together with voluntary firefighters and municipality staff. At the time, they had ways to measure. Uh, they had automatic measurement stations to uh, understand the uh, state of the river and the height of the water. Now, the data from those stations was looked at at the time in screens at the voluntary firefighter stations and also one of the offices of the town, the City Hall. At the end of 2016, the municipality brought on a, a scientist in atmospheric sciences in order to carry out monitoring of hydrology there and climatology. And she became the person responsible for early warning systems, a center that was inaugurated, opened in 2017. So I also joined this project in 2017 as part of the CLIMA uh, project for monitoring and climate forecasting to prevent water uh, disasters or hydrological disasters in Buenos Aires with funding from the Defense Ministry of Argentina. And it was, uh, it was rolled out between 2016 and 2018. The National Meteorological Service of Argentina was the beneficiary and it was executed by the Center for uh, Research on Oceans and Atmosphere at the University of Buenos Aires. In this project, we had a very clear meteo part from the research center that I just mentioned. And there was an anthropological side as well with anthropologists from the uh, Center of, for, for Social Studies, Rural Populations at the University of San Martin. The main aim was to develop tools for climate forecasting, seasonal and sub-seasonal, and to ensure successful transfer of that knowledge and tools. 
by including the needs and expectations of final users with the aim of increasing their ability to create efficient actions in the face of uh, severe weather events that had been forecast. Just before the Climar project, we had another interdisciplinary uh, project called Alertar. Here, we had identified civil protection, both at national, regional and municipal level, as a priority user for those forecasts sent out by the National Met Service, and which could be linked to mitigating the risk of flooding and other hydrological risks. So, from the anthropological point of view, at Climar, we decided to carry out ethnographic fieldwork focused on dialogue with civil protection. We understood that they had a social role in the face of extreme weather events, and therefore it was a privileged vantage point to understand the relation between the available services and the needs of populations exposed to these extreme weather events. So I was an intern in that project, so I carried out field work and ethnographic uh, field study between September 2017 and May 2019. Initially, the research was focused mainly on the dialogue with civil protection agents at municipality level, but as from what was revealed from our field work, we decided to bring on board other stakeholders the politicians, institutions, etc., that have a role to play in the face of adverse weather events, including civil protection, of course, but also including uh, employees, civil servants from other departments in the municipality, volunteer firefighters, and also representatives from scientific and technical institutions, both national and international. Later on, after the Climar project, I continued with a second phase of study of field work for my PhD as an intern for the National Council for Scientific and Technical Research under the leadership of Valeria, Dr. Valeria Hernandez. And here I also established dialogue with part of the population of the area of Areco, which is prone to flooding. In addition to the anthropological field work, we carried out uh, workshops uh, with teachers and students, primary and secondary schools mainly, in the urban area of San Antonio de Areco. The workshops were organized in collaboration with the follow-up and early warning system at municipal level that I referred to before. And the first thing we did was to work using maps of Areco and the river. And here the pupils, the students would pinpoint the relevant areas at local level and with different colors, they identified their homes, depending on whether their homes had been flooded or not. From that data, by consensus, we drew a line uh, to up to what point did the water reach in the latest uh, flash flooding event. The second part of the workshop, we worked on concepts like river basins, uh, precipitation, river behavior, thresholds, etc. The person responsible at the Municipal Early Warning and Follow-up Center delivered a presentation to teachers and students regarding the sources of information available and the follow-up pr protocol at the municipality. Also in the, that workshop, we uh, showed an, appli an application which allows to do follow-up in real time of the height of the river and uh, precipitation amongst other variables and to receive on your phone any alerts that are sent out by the national uh, weather alert system for the area. As a complement to one of these workshops in 2018, from this project, we set up a manual um, rainfall gauge and uh, we carried out measurements on a daily basis within a school-based project to work with the community on the forecasting of floods. This year, we began to carry out another series of workshops together with the Early Warning and Monitoring Center at the municipality 
But now we've gone to more rural areas in San Antonio. Now, in these workshops, we also set up uh, uh, rainfall gauges and meters. And part of this initiative, well, of course, this is still under development, but one of the ideas is to contribute to setting up a community network for monitoring of all of these variables. So the joint work with the early, the municipal early warning and follow-up system or center allowed us to set up thresholds of daily rainfall. And with this data, the municipality included in its uh, action plans, uh, a number of measures regarding hydrometeorological extreme events. And thanks to all of this work that we did jointly, we were able to set up a number of agreements between uh, different faculties at the University of Buenos Aires and the municipality, the town hall of Sanareco. First of all, an agreement was signed for the period 2017 to 2019, which was then renewed for 2019 to 2021 and then 2022 to 2024. So there are clear institutional ties which have been strengthened thanks to this dialogue and this continued presence over time. In addition, during this process, we opened up a series of question marks which came out specifically from that intersectorial and interdisciplinary dialogue. I'll just give you an example. As you can see on the picture here, at the end of December 2009, the Urban Center and uh, of San Antonio Dareco were affected by uh, flooding due to overflow of the Areco River. Uh, roads were cut off, uh, paths were cut off as well, and around 3,000 people had to be evacuated. That event meant deploying an emergency team with participation of the municipal, provincial, and national governments. Thanks to the ethnographic field study that I did, I saw that this flooding event was seen by the various local stakeholders as a landmark event, an unprecedented landmark event. It was a critical event at the time, which led to great social reformulations, especially in terms of how to uh, manage flooding in the city, in the town. We saw new forms of organization, new ways of perceiving things. And this event, I must underline, had a lot of impact on how in the future new uh, pathways would be set up, new roads, etc. always bearing in mind intense precipitation. And this was seen as, a, as an event that led to collective and institutional learning, uh, giving rise to better dialogue between the institutions and the communities. Here, more status was given to monitoring climate and meteorological variables. So with the aim of reconstructing the story of flooding at local area, we looked at uh, local press and historical archives. And of course, we did ethnographic uh, fieldwork, bearing in mind that the firefighters, voluntary firefighters in the region were the ones carrying out assistance to the population and evacuations when the overflow of the river occurred. I looked at the registers uh, of all the services provided by the firefighters since 1973, first entry until 2018. Now, during that period, 73 to 2018, I was able to see that approximately twice a year, these voluntary firefighters had to provide services due to overflow of the river and subsequent flooding. I'm also writing another paper and we looked at these very relevant uh, dates and we linked them with historical events of extreme rainfall uh, as gathered by Dr. Federico Robledo, also a member of the hub and the person responsible for the Municipal Center for Early Warning Systems and 
monitoring both the climatologists, of course. So a preliminary reading of this paper allows us to say that in San Alego, there had been previous and uh, subsequent flooding events, previous to 2009, which presented with characteristics from the hydrometeorological viewpoint that are comparable to that very critical event. So this opened up a question. On the one hand, how can we bring together all of this data, sources of information regarding the basin with meteo, with conventional meteorological measurements? And on the other hand, we also have to reflect on why events like the overflow of the river and subsequent flooding, which from the hydrometeorological point of view could be quite similar in nature, or comparable anyway, why do they present with a social, a, a different social impact? This means also that certain events are critical and cannot be understood without thinking also about the methods to interpret these events. So knowledge uh, from academia, and the climate agencies and the METS, National METS uh, Service has led to the local government taking decisions on flash flooding events on the basis of real science and data. Thanks to the ethnographic fieldwork, we were able to identify the various sources of weather and climate information which were present and were used by the various stakeholders in the territory. We were also able to identify spatial and temporal scales and the role of knowledge in the risk of flooding. Also struck the social structure where communities acquire even more relevance. This work also pointed to the need to bring together various types of knowledge, whether it be academic, but also local community knowledge to strengthen the early warning system. As a part of this dialogue, we also uh, came up with a number of publications from the intersectoral and interdisciplinary dialogue with uh, education communities. We were able to set up a national database. And here we represented all the work, the mapping work that we had been doing in those uh, workshops that I showed you earlier on. And in addition to this, we presented a number of papers at scientific uh, congresses uh, with uh, co-authored with the person responsible for the early warning system. So to wrap up, let me tell you that one of the main challenges that, that we have come up against uh, as researchers was to be able to maintain over time and take further the dialogue uh, going beyond uh, these specific mitigation projects uh, with uh, the corresponding funding sources for them. And at the same time, we believe that uh, in the case of municipal management, one of the big challenges is to ensure that there is a risk management public policy uh, and that it, that is also sustained in time going beyond any changes in government in, in in 2019, of course, 2019, there was a change in the local government. And that was also a challenge for us because we had to keep up that dialogue, keep up the linkages that uh, and connections that we had uh, built up and find new parties in dialogue, new interlocutors. And that is all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julieta. Thank you to everyone. Why don't we start the Q&A session now? And we could take questions, first of all, for the first speaker, Camila, and then we can move on to the questions for our second speaker, if we could. So the first question for you is from Dr. Shepherd, Ted Shepherd. He'd like to know about the measures at a local level. Do you think they could link up local know-how with official data, those measurements? And also, do you think there could be any tension created there, any stress? Well, thank you very much for that question. 
yes, I do think essentially that they this could be seen as a bridge, a, a link up between the official data and and the any tension related to the use of, of water in this area. Well, I think that goes back way beyond uh, when we started this, because this is a department in which farming, livestock farming is actually the main activity. And we're not just talking about the small scale farmers. There are also some big companies that are are using the natural resources there, perhaps misusing them, and the tensions that could be uh, created uh, around the possible use of, of river courses uh, have already been there, they exist. And if we're looking at perhaps uh, uh, how the, the, the river measurements, the, the height of the river, uh, might uh, also be of interest to the local community to find out exactly how to make the best use of that water and to be able to quantify how how much the the water is changing that river height and compare what they're seeing with the official measurements uh, that uh, tend to be uh, from way be before, years before we set up this network. And, and, at, and at least you can have an historical time series to check with. So yes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Camila. I should have said uh, yes, not Julieta. Thank you, Camila. Uh, and we have a question from Jeanette, who says, thank you for your work. And, uh, and she asked her question, who, who provides the technical support and the financial support for your local hydro metrological network? I don't think I mentioned it, but this, this whole project came out of a, a call for applications uh, for uh, a forum, JPI Climate, uh, this was, you know, application to get funding. These are international projects. Uh, they are European projects. So this climate services co-production project has been funded in Latin America from there and uh, going back to 2016 with funding running through all of these years that we've been working to uh, put to install uh, those uh, river level gauges, uh, to um, make repairs, also the rainfall gauges as well. Before going on to the next one, Camila, you were saying that the, the technical support for the project, I think it's from uh, the Atmospheric Sciences Institute, isn't it? They've been accompanying your process. Yes, I mentioned the financial support, didn't I? I didn't mention the technical support, it's both. Camila, we have a question from you from Panama. The question is, what are the character what were the characteristics of the community when you started off this rainfall monitoring? And, and once you started to record the climatological data, what happened in the community? The before this project started, the community uh, was also very much engaged uh, with them. Um, with measurement and, and rainfall, and, and this links up to another question because the the local sector for generations, uh, the farming sector and the producers had always been measuring uh, variables that they were interested in, and rainfall was one of those. So the community was specifically interested in this kind of of change, uh, uh, changes in the climate uh, and uh, rainfall and the use of local rivers. Uh, 
and apart and once we started recording the data there was a process that kicked off and in that process people realized that the rainfall that was falling in one particular spot and how that spot was becoming waterlogged and fund and flooded was all linked up with a with a macro context um, the rainfall that was falling further away perhaps uh, the higher uh, watershed uh, of the river and the community then started to share the data with the knowledge that this is something that empowers them and improves the productive strategies for the whole community. It's, it's not just about measuring, it's this point, but it's important to compare that data with the record, records and, and, and the, the figures coming from another area to compare the water levels. Yes, of course, last question for you. We, you're being congratulated for your work. And the first question is, could you identify if the producers were already measuring rainfall and sharing their data before your project? And if that was so, how were they doing it? I don't know whether you're able to answer that question. And, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I can actually, say that the, yes, they, they did use to, to, to measure rainfall, but not in the same way as the WMO uh, says it has to be done every day, at the same time of day, and uh, with the same process. Uh, I mean, the digital data measurement is all new, but yes, no, I, yes, there were records taken, but they weren't sharing the records in the community, I think is the answer. That's one question. The second question, which is more, about the ethnographic dimension. And it's a question about the perception of the space, about this, and you were talking about bringing together professionals and practitioners in mapping. In ethnographic terms, we're still analyzing this process. I think this is something that has to be finished off in 2023. Yes, this the, I, I'm I'm working in the area of climate sciences and I, not in in the ethnographic dimension, so I can't answer that. But I can tell you that the activity was performed with a group of farmers with tremendous knowledge about their own area of land, their territory, people who are able to very accurately uh, identify areas on their map. They have been living there and working there for years and they are con moving around constantly uh, the la on the land where they are farming and they're so familiar with the, the river courses. Uh, uh, I, could, uh, uh, I could go on about that. But uh, I, I didn't do the ethnographic part. Well, thank you very much. Camila, we have a few questions for Julieta too. We have a question from Ted Shepard. When you're, when you're, that when you're reporting at all the climate services here, uh, what about st stakeholder fatigue? Did you, and the question is, did you actually come up against that problem, that challenge when you took this ethnographic approach? Thanks for that question. Not really, no. I didn't uh, really know about that. Uh, I hadn't heard that expression, but 
I don't necessarily work so much with stakeholders in the in the ethnographic and anthropological field work that I do. That's what I was talking about interlocutors, parties in dialogue, uh, because I always see this as a dialogue. And in that dialogue, and there are different interests that are brought together, that are pooled. So no, I didn't personally find that in this particular experience working in Santa Antonio de Areca, fortunately, but I do feel that one possible way of mitigating this, uh, and I'm not sure that's the right verb, but, but uh, mitigating the, um, the possible fatigue issue, stakeholder fatigue would be to perhaps start off the dialogue and make sure that the interests of the different participants or agents or actors in the dialogue um, are, are brought together so that what you're, you're co-producing or you're generating can, can properly cover, embrace all of the interests of all the stakeholders and not just the interests uh, of, in this case, of the scientists and the researchers involved in the project. I don't know whether that has uh, answered your question. Well, thank you. But uh, if, you, if you want any more comments, then please add that to the chat. We have a question from Maria Arauz Nos there. Congratulations, I loved your work. It's the first comment. And there's a question on whether you can actually explain more about the linkage with the National Hydrographic Institute. And the second question is, what was the role of Santoni de Reco as a municipal government in their own area in your research? Did you have any issues with them? Thank you for that question. Well, in terms of the National Hydrological Institute, I referred in my presentation to a paper. I think I can put the link to the article in the chat. And this paper describes the flooding line that was done under consensus, looking also at the impact And this was uploaded to, to a geo portal at the National Hydrological Institute. I hope uh, I'm answering your question. As to the work we did with the municipality and its role in the project, as I explained earlier, when I began my presentation, this experience uh, was based on a number of research projects. So the role of the town council, the city hall, really depended on each particular project. As Camila presented, uh, they worked on the Climax project with a given duration. In our case, they took part with us throughout this experience, throughout, throughout the years, and uh, we brought them on board a number of different projects. Now, from the municipality, or at the municipality, our main interlocutor, as I said a number of times in my presentation, was the early warning and surveillance system uh, with a meteorologist uh, in the lead there. And also dialogue with, with other areas in the municipal government, which also had direct involvement in terms of designing and also in designing the early warning system at local level. So we talked a lot with them. That's uh, municipal level, but I also personally, uh, when I was doing the ethnographic field work, I also spoke to civil, uh, civil service actors like the voluntary firefighters, an association that doesn't depend or hinge on the municipal government. And also there were talks with uh, populations settled in uh, flooded prone areas or flood prone areas rather. Well, thank you very much for that response. 
another question from Jeanette for both of you is, are there any publications with uh, co-authored by researchers and also the local population? Members of the public? Yes, well, in our case, I referred to the Geo Portal a moment ago, but in addition, we presented papers at scientific conferences co-authored with the person responsible for the Municipal Early Warning and Surveillance Center. But this was a publication, a more academic, traditional publication. In addition, we also generated, how can I call them, products that stem from this dialogue, a number of articles and, and products that came up after that co-production experience, which are not necessarily scientific papers or academic scientific papers. As I said, in the case of San Antonio de Areco, the thresholds for flooding, uh, river height and level of rain, well, all of this data was included in the municipal official protocols which kick in as soon as there is an adverse weather event. In the case of the voluntary firefighters, I took a lot of data from them. I passed that data on to them. And they also used those figures as part of the statistics of their association. So we did generate quite a lot of uh, papers, but not only scientific papers, but also other products, which were also um, co-produced with others. Well, in the case of what I did, well, it's rather similar. All the products, all the documents, written documents, are co-authored with academic authors and non-academic authors, members of the public of the local community. More specifically, all the presentations that we give at scientific conferences and congresses always include local authors as well. And correct me, Flor, if I'm wrong, but I don't think we've uh, published in a peer review um, journal together with co-authoring with local members of the public. I don't think so, but we are thinking about it. Well, thank you for those answers and for both your presentations. Very, very interesting indeed. One final question that we have here. Will it be possible to read your presentations? Can you share your presentations? Let me tell you that uh, we've uploaded the recordings of these webinars. I put the links in the chat or rather the link is in the chat for you. And then you can listen to the recordings of the webinars in both languages, Spanish and English, and you can consult them at your leisure. Of course, the recording of this fourth webinar, I presume, will be made available in a few days' time. But we'll have it up and ready for you as soon as possible, so you can consult and uh, re-listen to Camila and Julieta. Yes, in the case of, of my particular work, I don't have a scientific publication yet. I'm still working on my PhD. It's an open-ended project. And uh, Manuel Espinosa said that there had been co-authored posters presented at conf scientific conferences regarding the community network for rainfall. And yes, that's what I wanted to say. And I repeat, in every scientific workshop or conference, 
we always show the authors, the scientific authors, and also authors from the local community. So if you're interested in the theoretical part of my work, if you check the website of our hub, you'll find a section which says literature or bibliography, and there you'll see the papers, you'll see an explanation of the methodology and also the theoretical framework for co-production that we use. So I invite you to take a look if you can. And that's all, thank you. I'd also like to add that we also have an email address for the hub if anybody is interested in any specific paper or article that has been mentioned, you can also send us an email, drop us a line and we'll let you know how to access it. Well, I think we've covered all the questions. We're so grateful to all the participants, also the speakers and the interpreters, and the interpreters are grateful to you for your kind words. It's been wonderful to be able to carry out this fourth webinar. It's going to be the last webinar for this year, I believe. But now given this initial experience as a hub, we'll have to see if we can have organize more webinars in the future. If you want to continue receiving any news on the Hub, remember to register. If you have registered, you will be part of our mailing list, so you will be up to date on any future activities. Well, thank you all very much for your participation. And I think we can wrap up now and call it a day. This will be the last in our cycle of webinars for this year. We have had great success. And remember that you have the recordings available if you wish to go back to them and listen to the presentation. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye.